All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Melissa Gardner from the Grad College, Grad Academy, if you don't know me. Um, we are happy to have Dr. Daniel Wright here with us today to present a workshop called How to Make Bad Plots. And I will hand it over to you. Okay, so I, I should point out, and I shouldn't need to point out, but when I gave a similar talk to a few different government things, this is ironic. But for here, we're going to do bad plots. So here, this is clearly a wonderful way to, to present a title. This is a plot that shows all the technology that we're unable to use, or at least most of it, and adding in all the sort of junk that you see people putting on some of the title pages, doing things also like having really long titles in colors that don't match up in a font that's bad, having a background that this isn't an actual photo. We, we live here. We know you don't get these angles on, on that sort of thing. And it's not UNLV. We have a very pretty campus. I could have included that. But again, that would have just gotten in the way a bit. Um, you'll see often in talks, people have been to talks where you get tons of information here in really little things. Uh, would you like to use your clicker? Yeah, let's use my clicker. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Where can we test it for? <laughs> yeah. So and this is one of the problems when you have a lot of this extra junk in here. Um, it can actually cause problems with the setups for things. So I, I will often watch other people's talks. I haven't done this for, for a long time, but I'll go to their lectures. And when PowerPoint was starting, somebody who was a little bit nervous gave his talk. And the way he had his talk set up, it was red with a little bit of black in the corner, this nice template giving it in a different room from this computer. And the block basically took over the whole thing. And he was so nervous, he just kind of kept going. And I'm sitting in the back just thinking, John, 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 just stop, turn the template off, go and, you know, but I think the nerves and stuff like that got to him. I think it's something to do with the, um, the, the Zoom. So see if you can just flick between it and get to a, there we go. Okay, I'm going to skip all the sound things. Um, so, so we'll get to this. Can, can you also get rid of that top screen is one of the options there. But it's a good thing to have that top screen there. If you've noticed, you do get most of the setup things have something at the top. And if you're doing stuff in Zoom, you have all the people on one side. So you want to take that into account if you were planning on doing a good plot and a good presentation. But again, we don't want to do good presentations, do we? We're not here to learn how to do a good presentation. <laughs> so you'd avoid doing that. So you do things like have this really long title. I took it out of that silly font and stuff like that. So at least you, you can read it. You'd want to start things by, here we go. Computers are too fast. So you, why would you start a talk with a talk that? or a paper that says a study that, sh and then go into that. People know that. So this has extra words for them to read, so it's particularly annoying. So again, this is why I've done it here. You can do things like, I'm gonna be very careful with my finger. You can change it to something short. Again, if you wanna be nice to people. You'd want to sit there and write in very small things. A few little gadgets to play with. Um, and you see this when people write down, oh, we're required to put all this stuff in there. Well, people can't see it. It's worthless. So don't, don't try to do that with it. Um, you can have things that are misspelled. You can have things like the psycho psycho that showed up somewhere in there. So these are things that when you're just doing the title page, you can convey to your audience. You really don't care about them learning information from your talk if you add on all this extra junk in there as opposed to something like this. I actually kind of, for me, it's nice having all these screens around because I, I, I don't need to lean back and look at things. It can look like I have everything memorized completely. You can have something like this, which conveys it really easily and really rapidly to everybody. Okay, the handout that you've got, here's another thing where technology interferes with people. I had spent a long time trying to get this rainbow writing for the title to show, and it was, I'm, the code I'm writing this in took a couple of pages to write that in. It caused my Adobe to crash. It caused 
uh, they tried a few printers, weren't able to get it to print off and cause Facebook to crash this morning. So avoid technology things unless you're really trying to mess up not just people looking at it, but even the entire world and Facebook. Okay, so what we're going to do, the basic theme of what we're doing, what we're doing today is we're going to concentrate on methods of data display that leave the viewers as, in, as uninformed as they were before seeing the display, or worse, those that induce confusion. So the key phrase there is inducing confusion. This is based on a talk by Howard Wayne. He first did a talk how to make some bad plots, not quite phrased that way, but several years ago. <clears throat> when I started lecturing, I thought, let's do that. Let's show some bad plots. And it turned into a whole bad results section. And then PowerPoint just is so wonderful for confusing people and for doing bad lectures. I thought, let's make sure we go and do that also. So I'm going to concentrate on three different modes of miscommunication. So you can miscommunicate with your audience in several different ways. One is numeric. You can show numbers that really don't convey what you want. Sometimes that's choosing the completely wrong numbers. So that's why you take stats classes and you do things like that. We're going to concentrate on a few other ones with that. The words that you choose, you can choose words that really don't help you with that either. And I'm going to spend more of the time on the pictures because um, that's more fun and you can have a lot more fun trying to confuse people with pictures and it takes a lot more of your own time to make these horrible plots. And so it means you can spend a whole weekend rather than doing something to benefit, benefit humankind. Okay, let's start with number miscommunication. One thing I see often is rounding inappropriately. So if you have four divided by seven, what's a good way to communicate that to your audience? Is it 0 0.57148257148714 or a few more decimal points? It means your audience reads that, and your audience thinks that that's the level of precision that 4 over 7 is conveying. So if you had 4 over 7 of the chickens had eggs that week, that tells you how precise your estimate really is. So you could do things like instead 57%, or better yet, tell people it's 4 out of 7, which conveys exactly what the data are. So that's something to consider. And again, you want to tell your audience, my numbers are so precise, they're out to 22 decimal points, even if they're really not that precise, because you, you don't care about your audience, right? You won't be doing a horrible display if you cared about your audience, right? Okay, good, good. Guidelines, there's lots of guidelines out there for how to do a good presentation. I've grabbed the one here from my field in sort of education and psychology, but every discipline has these things. And they're just a waste of time. They tell you how to present things in a clear and accurate way, not to mislead your people, but that's not gonna wow people. They're not gonna think, wow, that's really creative, how you multiplied everything by pi and when you were doing this. So again, avoid those guidelines if you want to do a really horrible presentation. As a stats person, so that's what I spend most of my time doing, one thing that's really interesting is when I read people's papers, often when they're sent to a journal and then sent to me, and they're describing some complex statistical procedure. And trust me, it's really, really clear when the person has no clue what it is. And they've just sat there and copy and pasted some code and tried to hope that it was going to work. See some smiles? Yeah. Good way to learn. First copy, paste, see if it works, then try to understand it more. But you see lots of people who clearly don't know what they're doing. Better yet, at a conference talk, when you, when you present something that's really complex, yeah, there's three people in the back row when their hands go up, you should be afraid. They're about to grill you on that. Um, so that's something to do. Make sure you present stats you don't understand. Um, there's also ways like tables. You can make tables really bad in, in lots of different ways. Um, one thing I used to do back in the days where we had overhead transparencies, where you'd go and put these on a projector to show. And people would leave the ones from the previous lecture because they just would leave them. So I would go through and I would grab one before these lectures and I would put one up. And it was often somebody photocopying a table from a book from the 1940s on these. So it was completely unreadable and much worse than this one. But it would also be impossible on these classrooms with 200 people for anybody in the back to read. So it was perfect. It was like, 
here's some data and they'll often say things like this is just for me you know you don't need to read it which of course begs the point of why you're showing it you and you get things like this are people really going to comprehend however many numbers there are in here we know the human brain you're lucky if you can get seven or eight things in 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 here to stay um, so clearly you're not getting this you're also doing something here that likely the most important ones are down here at the bottom and one thing that's um that's nice here this is going all the way to the bottom sometimes you'll give talks and it cuts off even before then you'll see people say oh yeah the most important bit's down there but and and again you this is a really good way to show your audience what you really think about them if you show a table like this it really conveys that well whereas if you show something I'm showing an arrow at the bottom, so it doesn't quite go all the way to the bottom. Oh, there we go. Whereas if you showed something like this, it's just much clearer. The audience isn't thinking, wow, you collected a lot of data. They're just thinking, oh, you drew a few lines on, on a graph, and here's what they're doing. One tends to be going down, one tends to be going up. So it conveys information about the data that you're actually trying to show them, rather than how great it is that you collected all these numbers. And again, that's one of the issues when you're presenting things. It should all be about you and not your message. You should be getting everyone excited by these things. Yes, we do have a story. Okay, PowerPoint. Who here has ever used PowerPoint? Okay, so everybody has. A, did I see your hand go up or not go up? Uh, not that I remember. I always use Google Slides. Excellent. Same thing, really. Okay, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that that's doing doing the same sort of thing. Um, so it, it applies equally what I'm going to be saying here, but not with quite as bad a reputation, let's, <laughs> let, let's say. So we can miscommunicate with the words and we can miscommunicate with the PowerPoint things that we're doing. So let's have a look at this. Okay, flowery writing. There's papers out there that look to see what happens when people have a nice word like show and change it to demonstrate or use and change it to utilize, and the grades go down. If you're marking essays, when they give those to people, the pretense of using a word just because it's longer is really an obvious thing to tell the audience that what you're talking about is so simplistic, you have to flower up the language to make it sound as if it's something more complex, so you should be worthy of calling yourself an academic. Whereas if you want to convey the information, use the simplest words, the highest frequency words that you can for that. So again, we'll want to use flowery ones here. We'll also want to show people that we really should have been a novelist. So the number of things that I've read in, in stats journals where it looks like the person is trying to be a novelist and trying to show how good a writer they were and that they, you know, they got to be in AP English 30 years ago or something like that. Um, and it really just, you're not. I mean, I get the same problem when I read um, lots of people in newspapers. The way that newspapers used to be written was people had information they wanted to convey, and it was done in the first paragraph, the main bits. And then people could decide what to read because they already bought the paper, now they were going through it. Now, because of clickbait, they don't give any information until you've gotten through the third or fourth ad. So they've actually changed the style of that to fit in with their way of making money and screwing the audience who they're thinking, we don't want to give you this information. We want to force you to read about whatever it is the ads there are. So um, what else can you do? This is always a good one. Being really confident, even though you're not that sure about the accuracy. Confidence is something that we know there's a relationship between confidence and accuracy. For when people are expressing things, people who are wrong are often very confident in it. So it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And that shows up in a lot of different things. And you'll see it if you're on social media, you'll see the people arguing some political point saying they're absolutely not wrong. And you know that's a good sign that there's something going wrong in their head for, for them not to be able to consider alternatives. Because certainly for most things people express any opinion on, in social media, there's enough different perspectives. So anybody who's really confident is probably very delusional. Um, and again, if you're not, if you're expressing confidence 
And then those three people in the back row raise their hand and say, didn't you consider any of the research from the 1990s or something like that? Then you're gonna, you know, that, that really shows them that you're just screwing the conference over by getting a free flight and not actually doing any work for it. So again, you can write, I'm trying to get it the same size. You can write small for slides and use weird fonts. And so I tried a couple of fonts that um, wouldn't show up when I was printing it. So I thought I'd just try to get something that would show up here. And I think that was the issue with the, with the handout. Okay. Oh, hi, Mom. Yeah, no, no, it's a good time. Hi, Mom. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good time to talk. I'm just giving a lecture. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm giving a lecture to, to a bunch of people, but it's fine for, for me to talk here. They, they don't need, they don't matter, you know, just doing that. Yeah, 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 no, um, yeah, I heard Taylor told, uh, you know, she's now running the NFL. That's good. Okay. Great, great, great. I guess I could try to convince them I really don't care about them some way in how I'm doing the presentation. Make a paper. That's a good idea. I'll make a paper airplane just to show how concerned I am with what they're doing. Thanks, Mom. Click. That was my mom. <laughs> I turned my phone off. One time the phone actually rang. Um, so I'm just going to make a paper airplane. So this is something, if you really want to convey to your audience what you're, um, how much you're concentrating on them, doing some other task is, is a really good thing for that. Because it shows them that you really not worry too much about what they're doing. And what you really want to make sure you, um, you, 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 you sort of do is make sure that they don't think in what you're doing. So one of the things, I saw a horrible presentation, this guy, Steve Lindsay. He was giving, he had come up with a lot of, a few big results in the previous years in some research, and he came up and said, okay, this next slide is really exciting. And of course, everybody remembered the next slide because he sounded so excited. Whereas if he just said, I'm really bored with this, click, we would have all been able to go and get coffee much sooner, and he wouldn't have had a really lively discussion afterwards about everyone was excited by it. So again, make sure you sound bored to your audience so that they get that conveyed to them. I mean, you sound really excited and are jumping up and down and conveying that this is really the most exciting result you've ever seen, they're going to think you're weird. <laughs> so we need to avoid that at, at all costs. Okay. So PowerPoint, we have one of us luckily has not used PowerPoint, but everyone else has. So what is PowerPoint? PowerPoint, people generally like it. So here's what Tufti said. So this was back when he was a professor at Yale, so fairly well-known person then, and even more well-known at this point. He said, PowerPoint corrupt, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Imagine a widely used and expensive prescription drug that promised to make us beautiful, but didn't. Instead, the drug had frequent serious side effects. It induced stupidity. I wish I could read that angle so I could turn around more. Turned everyone into bored, wasted time and degraded the quality and credibility of communication. These side effects would rightly lead to a worldwide product recall. So he's describing PowerPoint there, and he's lucky that Microsoft can't afford a lawyer, because otherwise that would, might sound a little bit libelous there. Um, um, of course, unless it was true and spot on, and they had to say, yeah, that is how we designed it. Okay. Um, and he's got a, he goes through his reasons for it. And if you Google Wire 2003 in this, you'll be able to see that. And the irony there is, yes, I realize I'm using PowerPoint, but I'm trying to do a bad presentation, so, so that's okay. And you can use, he's not against PowerPoint or Slideware in general, he's saying how it's generally used by people. And particularly people who sit there and let the wizard inside PowerPoint tell them what to present on different things.
He's really against PowerPoint fluff, which is the junk you add, like the little Yoda that I had on, on the previous ones. So when you add all these extra things that are supposed to convey that you're able to download some cute little meme from the internet. It's okay to put those in, particularly at the start or the end, or if it really fits well with what you're doing, but often people try to fill their talks with these. And again, that tells people that you can go and find cute little things on the internet and put them in, and that your data are so worthless that you think they should concentrate on things like this rather than looking at what you actually did. So when I Googled Tufty in PowerPoint, this was the first thing that showed up. So yeah, going and using PowerPoint, he goes and kills a kitten. So think about uh, when you're choosing to do it. But again, we're trying to create bad plots here. So think about every time you're waiting in a post office line and there's 16 kittens in front of you. Well, if Tufty's going around getting rid of those, you'll get through that line much quicker. So again, here we're trying to do bad plots that will help you to get those to get through the post office line quicker, but also you can use PowerPoint to avoid um, to avoid all those kittens. I think there's getting there we go. So good graphical presentation. I figured I should present something about good graphics somewhere in here just so you can see that it's not, you know, it's not what you should be doing. So I'm going to go through just a couple of things where people have talked about some of the things that they advise people they want to do a good presentation. So again, I said Howard Weiner, some of his work has, has and Tufties and a few other people's has inspired my way of trying to think about how to do visual presentations. So one thing Weiner says is you, you want to show all the data that you have. So this is a talk about doing bad presentations. What, so, so what do we think about that advice? <laughs> right, so good, I like all the boos there. He also said, show the data accurately. <laughs> show the data clearly. <laughs> okay. Oh, and actually, I've got these on here. I don't, I, I, I could have shown them. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna add those sounds for for the next few. So um, you can add them yourselves if you want. Tufty talks about above all, show the data. And again, this is something. Don't have the extra junk. Show what you want to have. If you have a story that you want to convey with your data, make sure those are key points of the story. Maximize the data to ink ratio. He talks a lot about the data to ink ratio, and you can take that to an extreme that's too far. But basically, if you're using ink. Make sure it's conveying data in some way that's useful. So I often give lectures where I show a squid and say, look, if you're using too much ink, you're killing squid out here. It's, it's, that's not how ink's made nowadays, but you can get the point with that. Take out all non-data ink. So all the junk that he has, that, that PowerPoint fluff or chart junk, which is a phrase that he's been using for decades now. Erase non-data ink. And again, don't take things too extreme. So when people look at some of his, his rules and take them to an extreme, you get things that are too minimalist to convey everything as clearly as you would want. And finally, revise and edit. And this is true with all forms of communication that you're doing. Um, he'd advise people to look over it, make sure you check all the things several times to make sure you're not saying anything that's wrong or that you have typos and things like that. Again, for what we're doing today, yeah, screw that. Just go and first draft's probably good enough for that, right? Saves less time. You can go get a coffee. Okay, let's look at a few plots. So in my field, one thing that we often talk about in education is how many kids are proficient, almost proficient, or failing on the different standards within education. There's whole issues of that you shouldn't split things into categories like that. Let's assume that splitting into categories makes sense for wh whatever purpose we're doing. One thing that you want to do when you make your plots is to ignore the way the human visual system works. So here's a plot. What do people think of this one? It's good for this lecture. And why is it good for this lecture? Because it's bad. Good. <laughs> good. 
Okay, so it's, it's bad though. Let's, let's see some of the reasons why it's bad. Here's some sciencey bits. So this guy Cleveland and Miguel several years ago, but people have replicated this in various ways, showed that humans are pretty good at being able to discriminate which point is higher here. Still pretty good at this one. So you can still say, oh, that one's higher on the left. Again, not quite as good at it, but still the length of the line, they're able to discriminate these pretty well. The field of psychophysics, they have people who look at hundreds of these and press little buttons and they do all sorts of things like that. Direction, so the wind arrows and stuff like that, were less good than with this one, but it's still okay. Angles, though, were now not as good. And angles are the thing that our, that pie charts are based on. So it means that we're not being as confused as we could be, so we could do things that make it worse, but it's still pretty far down the list. So that's why when people make pie charts, so let's get, a, get, let's get rid of the sides. When people make pie charts, um, they're not using likely the best thing they could do. So the package I use for most of my analysis is something called R or S, because they're the same thing. Um, and they have a function called pi, so you can make a pie chart. You can also go to its help facilities and see what it says about each of the things. So here's what, if you click on it, you'll see that it says pie charts are a very pretty way to make me think of food. And they show this nice picture of perhaps the one pie chart that is pretty useful and conveys information in a fairly accurate way. Okay, do people think this is really what's on their help page? Yeah. Maybe not. So their help page actually says, Pie charts are a very bad way of displaying information. The eye is good at judging linear measures, those ones up on the top row, um, and bad at judging relative areas. A bar chart or a dot chart is preferable way of displaying this type of data. So there's the person who must have spent a while writing the function to display a pie chart, because it's not easy programming that thing in to get all the sizes right and allow all the flexibility that it allows. And yet they knew this is what they're going to be writing for the advice. So that would have not been a, that enjoyable a couple of days for, for the person, person doing that. Okay, but this is, again, we want to use pie charts here. So here's, here's another way that we can ignore science. There's lots of web pages out there or apps out there that allow you to see how well people with different types of color blindness can see the colors that you use. And some things I mentioned are before, there's templates there that allow you to take into account different types of color blindness to make sure people can see them. But again, this plot we like, for one reason, if you take one of the most common types of color blindness, this is what people will see. So, and this is an equity issue. So if you're producing plots that people can't see, or that some people can't see, you're, you, that's a big issue. So again, in some industries and some government organizations, they're really careful on that. In some industries, they want you to print in the company colors on all these things, which ign often ignores this completely. Um, so think about that when you're doing things. Um, also think about a lot of the handouts are photocopied without color. So make sure that people can read them without color also. But of course, with this information, we could just show the percentages and convey it much more clearly to people. So there's no way anybody could have any of those pie charts known that the failure was rounded to 23%. So we're able to show much more information in a table. Often people produce plots because they think a table doesn't look something scientific enough or something. Please convey the information clearly if you want to show a pie chart, show it at home to yourself and then produce things that accurately convey the information to people. Seldom would you have something where the main point of your talk is this simple, but if it is, that's great. Because then it's a simple message. The typical talk, you should think about eight points that you're going to bring up, a 20 minute talk, three of which people will remember at the end of the talk and one of which they'll remember the next day. So this is what you're wanting people to remember the next day that's good, that's clear. It's also the issue there of making simple data appear complex versus making complex data appear simple. So in the same way in using flowery language or going to the 
thesaurus to change the words around that you're using. Um, you can have data that are complex that you want to make look simple and convey them and their content to the reader, or you could have really complex, or you can have really simple data and try to convey it in some sort of, uh, and try to convey it in a much more complex way. So here we have the boss from Dulber, and he's showing something that should be fairly simple. It's just five numbers there, the five percentages that make up that pie chart. And he's trying to make it sound really, really complex because that's what the boss and Dulbert would do. I think we had to pay like $50 to, 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 to go and use this cartoon in, in the talk. Or you can have something that is really complex and you try to convey it as simply as possible. So these are Feynman diagrams on Richard Feynman's van. So he had his van, he created these diagrams to help explain some aspects of quantum physics. And he then put them on his van because they look pretty good, fairly nice with that. So he's trying to take really complex things and show them in a much simpler way. And to bring all these things together, here is Tufty again. So this is the, the baddie who was saying PowerPoint is evil and we all love PowerPoint. He's now sitting you know, next to Feynman's van. It's a little degraded here, but it still shows some of the information. I'll put Feynman's original. Oh, yeah, I forgot to give him, him the boo, but I'm glad all of you did, so thank you. <laughs> um, his, this is Feynman's original one, so um, that was back in California. You were only allowed six characters for it, so you couldn't stick the U in there. Okay, and what, um, what Tufty has actually done is he's now, he's taken those and he's turned them into art. He said, this is the simplicity and the meaning in them gives it some value for that. And he does art things now and shows these. And you can go and if you want to spend a few thousand dollars, buy one of these things. Um, or you can make it with your own, your own hangers and stuff like that. OK, let's, uh, I should actually check the time. We're doing good. Let's look at one plot in a little bit more detail. So several years ago, I was giving this talk to the Higher Education Academy Psychology Network. And so I thought, well, let's do something. So I get a, a plot that looks, that is relevant to the psychology people, but it's relevant to all of us. Psychology is a discipline that includes aspects that are covered in, in a lot of the different disciplines that, that we're in. So this is where do psychology graduates go? And this is a bar plot. And if people were looking at this, what could they gather from it? The ranking. Yeah, you get the rank, and you can see how much, how many more people are in marketing than in, in teaching, and that there's more people in, in sort of social welfare. And here's the other category. It conveys information pretty clearly, right? So is that good or bad? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's bad. We want to make it so it's less clear what we're trying to convey. So I took it upon myself to try to make a graph that's more suited for this lecture, which is a bad plot. So here's what I did. How's this look? <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the sort of first thing is who, who has a cat? Who has a cat that sits on their keyboard? So you let your cat sit on the keyboard, things like that happen. We're starting down, down here at the bottom. I also added 0 0.00 after each of those because that's worthless ink. And I hate squid. You know, so mm -hmm. get rid of the squid by adding that 0 0.00 over and over. And there are packages that are so good for displaying data badly, they actually have that as their default mm -hmm. to add that 0 0.00 there, believe it or not. Also, um, I thought, let's put these into alphabetical order, because lots of times packages do that also. And that's what phone books do when they have 20,000 people in there. And the fact that you know, some of these are two word things, that's OK. It just means people have to go this way and doesn't convey them very well about the ordering of them. And finally, I thought, those rectangles were kind of boring. I kind of have to fit rectangles in there. But what about if I use a visual illusion 
that makes it look like they're not rectangles. So I can tell people, don't look at the data, look at the visual illusion that I'm presenting. Isn't this a cool thing? So I sort of set this off to, to, to the journal and the journal also said, yeah, this, this looks like a good plot. This was the article would have conveyed this is appropriate for that. So they did a couple of things with it. First, you know, they made these extra small. So they actually went worse than what I was trying to do. They added the Christmas effect there, adding the green and red, which lessens the psychophysics bit of the it going from a rectangle, but I think make it considerably worse also. They kept the 0, .00 in there. They changed the percentage to percentage. So they, they must have seen the title of the paper was how to do a bad plot. They must have seen all these other things were horrible, and yet they thought, oh, we need to correct this thing there. That, that must not be on purpose. That must have been this cat and he, he, he didn't notice. So I think on the whole, they did make it worse. I was just kind of upset they went and changed that particular word to uh, back to what my cat was. Um, my cat was very upset with that one. Okay, so this is about as bad as we can get, right? Any other things that we might do to make it the communication even worse? You could stack them. That is good. I didn't do that one, but that 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 would do it. How about if we're hungry and we don't have any cake? We can make oh my cake. god. <laughs> So this also, I'm using the uh, I'm using the legend here with these things, um, and so someone's trying to figure out whether this one matches with that one, this one matches with that one, and so this is a um, this is wonderful, isn't it? It's, it really anybody looking at this is not going to be able to understand where psychology graduate students are going. So if that is the point that you're wanting to convey. You've made sure they're not going to do this. And this is really useful if you made up all your data and you don't want anybody to check on it. You just make it so confusing when you present it, they just think, okay, I don't know whether that was made up or not. So it's got that advantage. So this is as bad as we can get, right? Wait, wait, wait. Didn't Dilbert's boss use a different type of plot? 3D. <laughs> do you think that would make it worse? Well, it says here the third uh, false third dimension. This is a waste of ink and is likely to make the graph more difficult to read. Walgreen and colleagues describe it as symbolizing the triumph of data, a uh, triumph of data technology over thought. So the example we, we, we used to give was we tell people when they're in talks and someone shows a false third third dimension to put their hand up and ask them what that means. Because that, then we'll, they'll then have to say, oh, it doesn't have any meaning. I just did it because it was a 3D button. And it will certainly serve to help that person to learn that they shouldn't waste people's inks, people's space, people's thought on stuff like that. Um, I was giving this talk to, my, uh, to a large grad student class, and we had a seminar the next week with somebody coming in for the whole department who showed a 3D plot. And they all stared at me like, Come on, Dan, you've got to raise your hand. Um, none of them did, so I failed them. So let's try to see if we can make this. Uh. <laughs> so here we go. I, I made the words a little bit bigger, just so at least that aspect can be seen. According to the Systat manual, so Systat's a package that came out of Yale when, when a guy called Leyland Wilkinson was working there. <clears throat> it's one of the better graphing packages that, that exists around has a really good manual, so he describes the psychophysics of vision and why they did certain things with it. And he describes how these false 3D pie charts incorporate nearly every visual illusion discussed in this chapter. So he really digs it to them. Uh, and you know, he's the author of sort of Systat. Any guesses what package this is made in? Systat. Yes, there we go. <laughs> so although um, he describes how horrible these are, as do the people in, from R, um, you know, they still know people, if you don't have it in, people are going to ask for it. And since that, you have to buy. So you somewhat have to do things because the customer says they want it, even if you know that's the wrong thing. R doesn't have to do that. R is free. So they, they don't have to do something when they know it's a horrible thing just because the customers want it. But 
they did it anyway. But they did. They did it for a purpose because it grew out of a package that was being sold. Okay, so here's about as bad a plot as we think we can get. So I was giving this talk there to the psychology group, and this was, you know, I walked into their, their place and they had this poster on their wall. And this poster actually shows where the data I got came from. So I looked more closely at their poster. There it is. They made it even worse by separating the slices of pie, putting things in this graded sort of feel. So trying to tell which one of these is down here, particularly onto purple, they managed on their published thing, this gigantic poster that you enter the room in, trying to con confuse people even more. So I thought, yeah, that's, that's good. I like these people. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of their thing, though, they, they had this button. This works better if I have my thing. Let's see if it works. So if you press this, that's what you get to. When, when, when so these oh things first God. came out, I was giving a lecture, and I had it here in my watch, and I was pressing the screen that was like this. And I'm inside laughing so much. It's, it's stats like I've given a hundred times before, so I, I could do it as a secondary task. And about 15 minutes, and I asked, does anybody really believe this is doing that? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> so it was, uh, um, so that again, if you want to tell your audience that you're really not paying attention to the lecture you're giving, doing something, some task like that is what you do. So yeah, this is, um, yeah, so from this, Somebody tell me where psychology graduates are going. And L L yeah yeah and and a different web page. Then you go and find the legend. So it's it's that useful. Okay, so we can see um, there's some bad plots. Here's Tufti's idea of what he thought was the worst plot he'd ever seen. Uh, this is kind of Art Deco kind of feel to it. But really not good at, at all. Um, we can change it into a bar chart, which gets clearer. We can put it in its with a zero to one hundred scale, and we can see things are going up a little and then down. But it's not a big thing. But it's certainly different than what that Art Deco kind of look is, which makes all sorts of bizarre assumptions with it. We could Tuftyize it by trying to get rid of as much ink as possible. Here's something that Tufty likes to do. So it's the off factor versus trying to do things clearly. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody at all? Any questions? Anybody? Question? Ah, question, yes. Dan. The so-called chart junk that you do not like is sometimes useful. It looks pretty and draws attention to the reader. Ah, I can't <laughs> believe somebody asked that. I think we get asked that all the time. It interferes with communication of the information. It belittles your audience to say that they will only look at your graph if it is pretty. If the data are ugly, the data are ugly. Oops. So. <laughs> If you're wanting to get that off ah thing in, show the clear plot that conveys the information that you want to show, and then show this. <laughs> Look at this. Look how this one's just trying to stay onto the table here. You know, the big sort of patriarch, matriarch of the family trying to look, look good and solid on there. Um, so go and show this one then. And that's, that gets the off ah factor in there, right? Okay, let's go for another question. Which baseball team is associated with these folks? These. Louder, everyone wants. The aviators. But is it the clearest way to convey aviators? No, I mean, it would have been clearer if, um, and we had a couple of people note that it relates to the shirt I'm wearing. Is this the clearest way to convey aviators? <laughs> I'll do the walk. <laughs> no, it's not the clearest way to convey it. It conveys that I'm a fashion guru 
<laughs> but if I wanted to convey aviators, I would wear this shirt. And I will be getting an A shirt of this format in a couple of years' time. So um, I will switch around a bit on that. But this shows it much more, much more clearly. So if I want to do a bad way to tell people the answer to that question, I'd wear this shirt and be very fashionable. If I want to do it clearly, I would show this shirt. Okay, so a few little things just Again, if there's any of you who are getting in a debate with someone who says, oh no, I shouldn't, you should produce good plots, because now you're all thinking, bad plots, bad plots, bad plots. Mm -hmm. So if you get into someone, someone who's suggesting that, you should know what they're going to bring up, right? So they're going to bring up that it's really similar things for words and for numbers and for plots. Do it with clarity, do it accurately, and don't add extra junk. So you want to convince them that you do want to add the extra junk, you do want to be unclear, and you do want to make sure you're not accurate because really, are you that excited about the research you're presenting? Yeah, yeah, you're not. So just add all this other stuff and let people get on with it. And then the final thing is that pretty doesn't count unless it's for fashion. And again, I, you can all see that I am the fashionable one in this room, right? And all of you can learn from me about nice fashionable things for that. Okay, let's I think it's there we go, we get the final sound bit. Okay, are there any questions? People have real questions. I not after being being thrown an airplane. <laughs> I don't have any more airplanes to throw out so I can't yeah. it's not really a question, it's just um a tip that was passed on to me um, that I found useful with uh, evil PowerPoint. Um, Dr. Forster in the chemistry department told me about this time he went to an external conference or something and then he went to pull up his PowerPoint on a different machine to his own. And they had like a different version of PowerPoint and it came in all stretched and all the font had gone weird and it was hanging off the page and it was like a disaster. Um, and you, he was saying since then he always you mean, you, makes. You mean it was wonderful? Yes, it was perfect. Um, and he's saying since then he always makes a PDF version so that instead of being the unprofessional person that's panicking at the front, you can always, it might not be quite as nice, but it's definitely going to be better than, you know, if you can't open it and PowerPoint be evil, you know, PDF might be the way to go. So it's like have a backup PDF. And, and that's so, you can always scroll through that. And, and that's something certainly in the old days everyone would make sure they would have that because in the old days each operating system was a bit different the versions of powerpoint yeah, it, mac to yeah PCs, macs and pcs yeah. uh, the linux type things but also the versions of it things would move around the templates were different so everything was different they've improved things along the way but yeah as a pdf that's a better way to go and you can um some of the bits here you know and you will occasionally have it where a sound is useful there, you can build those things into PDFs, I, not through PowerPoint, but, but you can use, use other methods to do that. You also have the thing, um, I had, I think, one of a, a talk which I felt pretty good afterwards with. It was when they were aware of this, so they asked everybody to send their talks in three weeks in advance or something. You know, who, who writes their talk three weeks in advance? But um, so I, I sort of did, which meant I hadn't looked at my talk for three weeks. Um, so that they could check it to see if it works. And then you get to your room where you're giving your talk and there it is. Well, I got to my room and it wasn't there. And I then said, okay, I'm gonna tell you what I did. And that actually worked, I think, really well. So people were tired. They didn't want me to go through the tables and stuff that I had. So I just went through and talked to it. And it was fairly similar to what happened when they had a new head at IBM. This was about 15, 20 years ago, where he was going around to each unit to ask them what they were doing. And he got to the first one and there were two people doing a presentation because people think it's more efficient somehow to have two people present than one person present. And he walked up and he turned off the projector and said, tell me what you do. And that got around really quickly to tell people PowerPoint is not a talk. He wants you to tell them what you're doing and just tell them what you're doing. Um, so yeah, so, so there are, there's concerns about PowerPoint becoming the talk. And I can say, um, I'm sure a lot of you are teaching, it's really convenient if you have a pretty detailed set of PowerPoint slides 
when you look at them the night before the lecture, but you gave it the year before because it will help you to learn it. But that's not necessarily what's going to be best for, for, for conveying the information to the audience. Kind of a semi-related question. Say you're working in a group of people and you have someone who loves a thesaurus, who loves um, chart junk. What would you suggest would be the best way to introduce Without being caught. Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, um, yeah. For the thesaurus approach, the Ig Nobel Awards. Do people know what the Ig Nobel Awards are? So there's the Nobel Prize. Explain what the Ig Nobel Awards are. <laughs> the ones where you go, like, how did you get funding to do this? Yeah. <laughs> so one of the Ig Nobel Awards fairly long ago was. The, was the first one where they took where they just made these words more complicated and did six studies going through it. So, so actually fairly good, good sort of piece of research. And then the guy now is one of the bigger names in, in the world of business colleges. I think he's at Berkeley now. And um, he, he went through it and said, here's these things, you know, your students will rate you lower. If you do it as a student, your professors rate you lower, all in all, just going through that. And so that's one way to start off it. Uh, as far as the charts, the Tufty work may go a little bit more extreme, but he's got five books and workshops that he goes around the country giving that tell people to avoid chart junk. So it's it, it, so you want to try to get people to make the decision themselves, because that will mean it's a longer lasting decision than if you tell them to go and do it. But explain to them you know, here, this isn't conveying this information as well. You could suggest, like, if they do a pie chart or something, to say, "Oh, let's let's run a study to compare how much information people gather from these things." Um, that's one way to get an advisor, in particular, to 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 realize, "Oh, I guess that's wrong." And a lot of the problem is people who've been doing stuff for decades in certain ways and haven't been corrected in lots of these things. And for talks, people don't get corrected on using these things, people laugh quietly in the back row rather than telling them that's bad, particularly if you know, they've been doing it for 20 years. I mean, Will will know, Will's been in some classes, you know, I, I will occasionally make comments to students and they'll say, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. But there's a power dynamic there. So of course they're gonna say that makes sense because I'm gonna be, you know, I'm likely gonna be giving them an A anyway, but you know, they're, um, they still have that little idea that maybe he's a hard grader. I got a question about uh, the people that are color blind there. So, in this case, what do you suggest for colors? Well, there's templates that, that exist, um, or palettes to use the proper word. So, whatever package you're using, the package should have done stuff so that the defaults kind of match up with that, but they don't always do that. Um, so what you want to do is often doing things like with these apps, just go and write your know, colorblind check app or something to Google and you'll get to one you can stick the things in and then you can see which ones it does. There's lots of different types of colorblindness. You won't be able to make it good for everyone. But if you have things where at least if it turns to monochrome, the people can still look at it figure out what the things are, that usually works. Um, you really want to avoid too many colors on things. So when I use colors, it's mostly in line plots and I'll, I'll use the different ones, um, but also make clear that you know, it's not 20 different colors going up there um, usually, but just making sure that you say, here's this label on this one, so you can do that. I mean, fortunately for, for us, um, you know, other than the main red, green color blind, it's fairly small percentages. So most of the government, the government places that have guidelines on it, it's guidelines, not, not rules, um, they'll tend to focus on red, green color blind, which affects, I think, 10% of males or so. I think I've heard some advice too, um, like to make it not rely on color alone. So like if you have lines, like three different lines, you can make them different colors, but then also make meaning 
one dash, one dot, and then one solid or something like that. So that if somebody if it gets turned into black and white, for example, then at least there's another way of telling you. And instead of the legend way over here, <laughs> having an arrow pointing to that saying, this is the you know, jets, this is the sharks, or something like that. Oh, I should say also, this is the final lines there at the bottom of the handout, is um, if you're interested, I teach a few courses in stats over in the educational psychology group. So we teach some that concentrate on using R more and kind of a background on why you'd want to use statistics in various for various things and build up a stronger introductory statistics things over six credits over two courses than you would usually get in a single one, but also learning R along the way as you're doing that. And we're hopefully going to be putting that together in a micro-credential for the grad college once those things get, once that pathway opens itself up. Um, and you've taken those courses, so if people have questions that they don't want to ask me about, they can ask, they can ask Wilson. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wright, for being here and presenting with us today. This is probably up there on the entertainment of our, <laughs> of our Grad Academy workshops. Um, you all will receive a survey by email, so please you know, fill that out for our future reference. And thank you all for coming as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.